In today's video, I'm going to be talking about the World Health Organization. We're going to be looking at its role in public health and the criticisms that are given against it. This is for um, the A-level OCR geography spec in the disease dilemmas specification, uh, where we need to know the role of an international organization in combating disease. So it is an international organization. There are 194 member states that are part of the World Health Organization. It is a part of the United Nations um, and there are six regional offices, but its main headquarters are in Geneva. It employs lots of people uh, and it works very closely with other UN agencies. Um, in terms of what it actually is, it's considered to be uh, the global guardians of public health. So the standard to which lots of national governments look to uh, and uh, charities look to often is set by the World Health Organization. And we'll look at the other roles it has um, in this video. Uh, it, like I said, it's part of the UN and it's, therefore it works with other parts of the UN very closely, UNICEF and the World Bank. But it also obviously coordinates with national governments um, and works with international charities relating to health like Médicis Sans Frontières or the example I've given here is the International Red Cross. I'm now going to look into the role that um, WHO plays and that can, can be broken down into so several parts. One of the obvious ways that it um, is important on, in the globe in terms of public health is that it's a leader in um, setting standards but also it, it tells uh, the world what to care about in certain key areas um, relating to health. So um, it will often set out guidelines um, or standards for countries to try and meet on key issues that they think are important in terms of health. So they will use experts and researchers and see what they think um, is, for example, a safe air pollution level. Um, so they at the moment think that for particulate matter that 10 micrograms per meter cubed is is a safe level that has been uh, coordinated by who who have got lots of experts who have uh, agreed on this guideline and then they set that out to countries for them to meet it and if they meet it then their air is safe um, they also say there are issues that we uh, need to look at as countries they kind of um, lead on those issues so um, combating uh, drug resistance, um, ending huge epidemics in AIDS, uh, tuberculosis and malaria. Uh, that they're the leaders in trying to get that done. Um, but also in other areas like t uh, tackling uh, the increase in non-communicable diseases, especially in emerging countries. So they, they are leaders in both what we should be looking at, but also the standards which they want countries to, to try and meet. They also collect a lot of health data. So the 194 states, um, they take information and data which is given to them by those countries and they publish it in this annual report called the World, World Health uh, Statistics. Uh, and things that they might cover in there could be death rates from certain types of diseases, the life expectancy levels, also things like how much the government spend on healthcare, but also are they trying to meet the universal um, indicators that um, are, have been set out by other parts of the UN, for example, the Sustainable Development Goals. Here's an example of some of the data they've collected in COVID. Um, you can see here that they've collected data on the amount of excess deaths that have been caused um, in relation to COVID, and they've, they've broken it down by different countries. Um, they also cr create these country profiles. This is the country profile of Ireland and shows you um, what basically people die of in Ireland. So it's mainly non-communicable diseases, which is then broken down um, into different categories. So they collect all this data and then they can help use it to, to do other, other things like set guidelines, like see patterns and various other bits of their functionality. Well, another thing that they um, do is that they monitor the health situation, partly related to what we just talked about, collecting data. So they see what kind of issues are going on in the world relating to health. An example of this um, is that they might see if an outbreak of disease has happened in a country, but they also might be looking at ongoing endemic issues, so diseases that are constantly there. I've put some examples here of COVID and monkeypox, which are two diseases that have come out um, in the 2020s that they have been monitoring 
Um, uh, and they obviously were important in uh, monitoring the situation when COVID came out of Wuhan in China in 2020. But they've also, um, they're constantly looking at other long-term issues like dementia, HIV, that are endemic in some countries, and they're trying to, to see uh, what's happening with them over a long period of time. They also um, are important in providing technical support during a, a kind of a health crisis. Uh, they can come in different stages, so um, they can help countries prepare before a health emergency. So that might be uh, seeing what their healthcare service facilities are like, the, the quality of their doctors or their um, uh, hospitals. Uh, the prevention and control that could be involving in trying to find um, vaccinations and trying to research vaccinations, come up with new vaccines to help prevent diseases. Um, and then actually when emergencies happen, they can actually send uh, technical support. And that sometimes that can be in the case of actual people and experts to help set up systems in countries. But also it can sometimes be supplies and they actually have these um, standardized kits that they uh, kind of have approved that, that countries can use. Um, so they know that they're going to be a very, very good quality. Uh, some examples of this would be that in um, Liberia in 2014, there was an Ebola outbreak and that led to a wide collapse of their healthcare system. Who were responsible for coordinating the emergency health response? Um, they worked with UNICEF and the International Red Cross and they actually implemented a whole countrywide vaccination program for measles to try and combat that while Ebola was going on because both of the diseases were overrunning um, the healthcare system at the time. Another example that's um, slightly more modern is they would give technical support during the COVID era. So they, they told countries how to set up um, vaccination centres. Here's a diagram. This was a standard issue by the WHO, and they said anywhere in the world you could set this up and it would be safe. Um, you might have seen these in the UK. They also gave advice on uh, what pu the public and people could do. So they had these hand washing guides and also told people to wear masks and keep um, one to two meter distance. All of this was technical support that was given to countries to help them um, uh, deal with the, the crisis of COVID um, during the, the months after it actually came about. They're not only um, trying to deal with its uh, diseases after they happen, but actually try to research healthcare issues so they can prevent them in the future. Um, they've got lots of research groups at the moment uh, on issues like dementia, tuberculosis and HIV and AIDS. And they're often working with other organisations to research diseases and come up with these vaccines, um, especially national governments and pharmaceutical companies. Uh, a really good example is uh, when WHO got together uh, with GlaxoSmithKline um, and various other organisations to try and come up with a malaria vaccine. This took nearly 30 years of research. Um, and in the last couple of years, WHO have actually approved um, a vaccine. Um, its uh, actual trade name now is um, Muscurix, um, uh, but RSS is the kind of chemical name. And they've approved it in the last couple of years. And this has meant that it's been used in children in Africa and over a million people have actually been protected. A million children have been protected because who has recommended this new malaria vaccine? And it's looking like it's going to be put out there into the, the world even further in the next couple of years. They also work with member states to devise strategies and policies. So um, an example um, of, of working with a national government that I've used here is they have a, a country cooperation strategy agreement with Ethiopia, like many other countries, and they're trying to meet the, the UN um, World Health Organization goals, which are universal with that of the Ethiopian government. So they're trying to get the Ethiopian government to make some changes so they can actually meet those global goals. And one of them is to try and uh, reduce malaria uh, incidents by 50 percent by 2023. Um, so that can involve, um, you know, trying to get rid of communicable diseases, but also maybe offering advice. So this is where the the long term goals of the uh, World Health Organization are being implemented by talking to, to member states. There are some criticisms of um, the World Health Organization and um, 
one of the most obvious ones is that the money that they do, they get for doing most of the work is actually by voluntary contribution from member states. Most of this comes from developed countries. You can see that Germany, USA um, and the UK are very high up there. Also, some private organisations like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, give a lot of money. And this can be a problem because if a country um, decides for whatever reason to fund it for less, that means the who can do less work globally. So Trump um, uh, got uh, annoyed because of um, the, he thought that who was being very China centric and decided to pull out uh, of um, funding them in 2020. And so they lost um, millions of dollars of funding uh, over a couple of years. Joe Biden has subsequently gone back in since he's been elected, but that was an issue that uh, affected who um, during the COVID uh, period. Um, they've also been at times been criticised for reacting too slowly to certain outbreaks of disease. Ebola hit West Africa and 11,000 people died. An independent um, research team from Harvard said it was too slow because it actually declared an international health emergency but they'd been given uh, data from Guinea and Liberia and West Africa five minutes before, which means they should have seen it uh, coming. So lots of people on, in those countries um, were making who aware, but who responded very, very slowly. Um, the, another one of the big issues is that the, they give all this advice. They are an advisory organisation, but it's not legally binding. So member states can ignore some of the guidelines if they want to. An example here is um, of a, an Indian city where we can see loads of smog and pollution. Um, many Indian cities are way above the safe levels that are given by WHO, um, sometimes by five or six times. Even um, advice given in COVID was ignored by some countries who decided uh, not to lock down, uh, which uh, wasn't official advice by WHO, but it was considered kind of a good practice for some countries to stop the spread of disease, Sweden being a good, good example of a country that didn't do that. Um, the other, the big issue is the fact is it's a huge organisation, um, a global organisation uh, over 194 member states, and therefore often it's uh, criticised of being stretched too thinly over those areas while trying to deal with quite complex health issues like HIV and AIDS, and so it can't actually be as effective as it wants to do.